Thank you very much for your kind introduction, for your interest in listening a little bit about the status of recreational fisheries in Europe. My name is Robert Arlinghaus. I'm delighted to give this keynote today. I'm a long-term member of the American Fisheries Society and for many years have been coming to this conference. And um, yes, I'm very happy that we could find this way of doing this presentation in, in these difficult times. So my talk that was given to me or that was asked for to deliver is about trends in inland recreation fisheries in Central Europe. Um, I have a few people on this slide, Dieter Kümmel, Marina Schaft and Robert Arlinghaus, which I want to acknowledge because those are team members that helped me put together some of the material that is presented here. So we are going into Central Europe, specifically Germany. Europe is very diverse, as you can imagine, and I'm more researching the, the German or Central European components, and that's what I'm going to talk about. We first look at the global pattern of recreation fisheries participation. Here are the percentage um, uh, participation rates um, um, from, uh, as uh, the fraction of the general public. And you see that lots of this is, is quite red. These are values above 15 to 20 percent of the population that contributes or participates in recreational angling. And the values are a little bit milder here in Central Europe. So here we find participation rates that usually range between 2 and 7 percent lower than the global average that is about 10 percent which already indicates that the relative interest in recreational fisheries here in central europe is smaller than for example in the united states australia russia or also in china and the reason is among other things that we have a stronger degree of urbanization and a greater decline of the popularity of urban lifestyles in central europe that is tied to the high population densities and changes in modernization forces. There is a reason spike, as in many other countries, caused actually by our COVID crisis. So this is search volume on the term angling in German. And you see here a clear spike. We could look at uh, further trends in the past. And it's really different um, pattern from, uh, from the past. And we also know from lots of uh, suppliers of angling tickets from angling clubs that they are seeing record attendance these days in recreational angling. So there's a little bit of a renewed interest currently in recreational fishing, and we have yet to see whether this trend continues or not. The long-term trend, however, can best be described by the life cycle of Indian fisheries, which basically is a conceptual model saying that with economic development of society, with urbanization, with increasing wealth, but also with increasing degradation of aquatic ecosystems, there's a characteristic shift in the main user group, the main stakeholder of um, uh, inland waters, moving from a focus on commercial and subsistence fisheries in less developed nations over to a dominance of recreation angling in more developed nations, which at some point with very high levels of modernization and urbanization again declines. And a new player comes in, which is broadly speaking conservation, or other water-based recreational uses, but mainly the idea that other issues than fisheries interests also become dominant and relevant. And we see that particularly in highly industrialized nations, that conservation issues of biodiversity conservation particularly become equally or more important as a guiding frame for the developments in inland waters. And that's the situation where we are in Central Europe. So it's on the right side of this graph where inland commercial fisheries have basically declined or in many cases even become extinct. Recreational angling is the major fisheries form, but conservation interests in the wider sense are really important in guiding developments and uh, discourses in the inland fisheries sector. This can, for example, be nicely shown in the discourse around fish stocking. If we look here back in time, we can identify an early phase where commercial fisheries were really important, commercial Indian fisheries, and in the 1970s, for example, the German Fisheries Association was formed, and very large-scale stocking programs to foster, to promote commercial yield were initiated. We, we, this phase more or less uh, went until the 1930s, and in order to increase fisheries production, also it was very widespread to introduce non-native fishes, particularly also from North America, the rainbow trout, the book trout, the large mouse pests, and so on, were brought in by the German Fisheries Association to enrich the communities to increase fisheries yield. 
From the 1930s to the 80s, we had a phase of compensation and fisheries optimization in relation to stocking. Again, fisheries objectives were dominant. And we also, in the communist Germany, we, we, we repeated the pattern in the 60s and 70s, where we uh, introduced from Russia, particularly Asian carp, to fill vacant niches and increase fisheries catch. Then in the 80s, latest in the 90s, new research popped up and a change in, in public values as relates to the use of aquatic systems happened. And today, undiscriminate stocking is no longer seen as a good idea. Today, conservation of biodiversity of species and populations is guiding and stocking is often done as a way, as a conservation practice rather than one to increase fisheries yield. And this is a, an example of the shifts um, which we have seen and which um, probably in this very similar case uh, have been going on in other parts of the world. Specifically, also, we see a change or a new trend, not only in aspirations towards fisheries management goals, but also specifically what the public, many of which are not anglers, think about our activity. I only have 10 years of data here, but this is agreement data with a few statements that we ask to the general public in Germany about recreational fishing. And you see very strong declines in the percentage agreement rates in representative public surveys, for example, to the question whether recreational fishing is a reasonable activity. It declines from 66% agreement to only a third agreement today. And similarly, the question whether recreation angling is good per se is also declining from around 50% to only 25% in less than 10 years. And this shows a quite dramatic erosion of public support uh, of recreational fisheries that is a major trend that the sector is now um, struggling with. And this combined an increased interest in biodiversity conservation, more modern policies, environmental policies to protect biodiversity, terrestrial but also aquatic, as well as a losing support of recreational fishing leads to a new trend which is increasing constraints or even bans on the activity in nature conservation areas that are designated very often for bird protection, but also for protection of certain habitats. But birds is very often a dominant taxa group that motivates these constraints. And whenever nature conservation areas with the aim to protect birds, for example, are designated following European uh, legislation very often, then uh, recreational angling and commercial fishing are under heavy pressure and often are actually banned. And the underlying argument is that recreational fishing is supposedly a big factor affecting negatively biodiversity in general, but also bird biodiversity. If uh, this, of course, is a major um, conflict source for recreational anglers, here is simply a snapshot of public media um, in one area of Germany that, sh that shows what, how angler lobby groups actually um, um, lobby for, a, for uh, removing the bans that are institutionalized or are supposed to be institutionalized in many um, rivers, for example. So it's a major source of contention, of conflict, and many, many recreational fishing groups are seeing themselves in a very defensive role nowadays that they have to defend their access even to many uh, systems and constantly face threats to be alienated and actually banned out of certain areas with the underlying general premise that ending is a disturbance to the environment. When we look at the data, uh, the situation of course is a little bit uh, more complicated and more balanced. And um, this is very new research and we have actually done some of that recently. Um, we took advantage of gravel pit lakes, newly created lakes, where um, actually uh, um, you can nicely pair managed lakes for recreation fisheries with those that are unmanaged. And we compared, for example, the species richness across different taxa. And what you can see in the lakes that are managed for recreation fisheries, they actually have a higher natural fish biodiversity. Though, though this is not, nat not non-native fishes, but it's actually a higher native fish biodiversity, which is introduced into these um, artificially created systems, of course, by stocking. On all the other taxa, waterfalls, songbirds, odonata, riparian trees, submerged macrophytes, etc., at the level of the species richness, we don't find any difference between those systems that are 
taken out of the recreational fishing use and those that are managed. So the general basic argument that recreational fishing severely harms biodiversity does not hold, at least not when you look at the species richness level. And this is something that is ongoing research and we as a group are trying to communicate to uh, the debate in order to make it a little bit more balanced and, and look at really the evidence for some of those um, um, policy actions. So another example, we are recently completing a meta-analysis on the impacts of water-based recreation, including angling on uh, birds, but also other taxa. This is a talk by Malvina Schaft, if you're interested, that is also offered at this meeting. And here you see the uh, average effect sizes um, of the impacts of different activities, including angling on individual birds, bird populations, and bird communities. And what you see is that there's a lot of variance. The, the, Mean effect size is negative, so indeed there is a negative effect, but it's strictly speaking not significant, at least not in the case of angling. And so there is a lot of local variation that uh, says under certain conditions there might be impacts, but it's not a general case. And again, this is evidence-based that science can contribute and is currently contributing in our environment to actually uh, remove the emotions and the value judgments that are in this very contentious conservation slash um, fishing use debate. Another example in this area, a trend that we see is a big critique on some forms of stocking, particularly the use of carp, common carp, which is actually native to the Danube system. It has been introduced um, in, in the northern catchments of the Danube, um, but it's there for many, many years. And fortunately, it's not uh, having naturally recruiting populations in Germany, so everything is stocking based. But uh, nature conservationists often think that even a single carp in an ecosystem is actually responsible already for a shift from a turbid to uh, from a clear water to a turbid state. And for that reason, um, there's a lot of move to actually ban carp stocking in general, and a lot of conflict with recreational fishing groups because they actually want a little bit of carp in their systems to be harvested. Um, unfortunately, much of the underlying evidence for this shift is based on enclosure experiments where very, very high carp biomasses are used here up to 1,500, for example, and those are radically uh, non-natural. So many, many, and um, the situation in the lakes is uh, maybe stocking rates or biomasses of 50 to 100 kilograms per hectare. So this research is not very insightful for what happens in actual lakes and whether carp are actually leading to a shift um, in ecosystem status. So what we did is do a few experiments, released stock carp and measured uh, using a before after control impact design, what really happens. And here are just two examples um, of situations before and after stocking of, of carp up to 180 kilograms of biomass per hectare. And you can see that the averages here in the Seki depth and the total phosphorus completely overlap. So we, at least in our experiments, could not find uh, that type of dramatic impact. And as the examples before, this is research that we are trying to feed into the discourse to say, look, we have to perhaps balance different interests and the impacts of recreation fishing are perhaps not as, as strong as many people claim based on outdated or wrongly interpreted science. The next trend we see is we are a highly urbanized society, so people actually become very specialized in the choice of the, um, uh, their fisheries. And if there's also a big move uh, using social media to actually use modern gear types, there's a technological advancement. And tied to the, those changes in how people fish and who fishes, there's also characteristic changes in what people do with their fish. So these are catch and release rates for certain species in coastal lagoons around the island of Rügen. And you see here in the blue, the more modern, in just in modern time, 10 years between the red and the blue, you see that the fraction of released fish in some species has substantially increased. For example, in pike, it is over 60%. And this is voluntary release of legally harvestable fish. And you can say, great, taking the situation of the US, uh, this is conservation behavior, the exploitation rates are reduced, all good. However, in Germany, we have a very long tradition of uh, justifying recreational fishing as subsistence. So as a way of generating food. 
And you can, of course, interpret this practice also as playing with food for no good reason. And this is exactly what happens as a big trend. And there's not only animal rights groups that push this agenda who actually don't want any form of use of, of, of fish and wildlife. So they use the catch and release kind of a symbol um, to, to say, look, this is cruelty to an animal. And they are all, the agenda, of course, is actually ban of the activity overall. And that's practically impossible because you can always justify it based on the food argument. But you have the same um, critique, related critique also by the anglers themselves because a large fraction of German anglers actually is subsistence oriented. And they actually don't like this more, yeah, play-oriented uh, uh, recreation fishing style that is so prominent, for example, in musky or large-mouth bass fisheries in the US. So certainly very different culture here compared to your environment and something that is in the media all the time. There are court cases. PETA tries to fine uh, people. There are over a thousand cases every year. And it's a major thing that is also tied to social media because many of their texts come towards people that show the release event on social media. So there's a lot of um, fear among the more popular influencers to actually not portray catch and release events in the German environment and only say, well, they happen in France or Netherlands where this practice is actually no problem. And all of this, of course, relates to an underlying shift in moral values in society. So here's the percent uh, people agreeing with the statement that angling for sport is cruel. There seems to be a relationship with urbanization. It's almost a quarter of the German public that thinks angling for sport is cruel. And if you look at the average of the US, the support is much, much larger in the society. So there is a sizable fraction, I would say one fifth of the German public that is actually highly critical of recreation England on moral grounds, both for animal welfare, but also for nature conservation. And this trend is slightly increasing over time. There are other sustainability issues we have to talk about. One is, of course, environmental change. We are seeing lots of evidence of climate change impacts, but also hydropower and other aspects that strongly affect the sustainability and resiliency of the system and are largely out of control of recreational actors. So that's another trend that we clearly see um, that reduces the resiliency of many systems. And you can see that, for example, in dramatic declines of once abundant resources, such as the contemporary European eel decline, which probably has multiple causes, and one of them is simply global change trends that affect the recruitment patterns of that species. And this is very, very relevant uh, for many anglers and commercial fisheries in Germany. If you look more into the actual sector, um, the actual sector of recreational angling, of course, there are trends and issues there too. So first of all, there are three big common pool resources that anglers are competing for, fish, angling sites, but also catchability, because um, fish, of course, learn and be selected upon to not be so voracious foragers and not bite anymore. So there is that common pool resource as well. And whenever there is a perceived or real decline of the common resource, people respond. And the prototypical management responses in our environment are some size limits, usually minimum length limits that are put in to avoid recruitment overfishing, as well as stocking to elevate the abundance of fish. And that's perhaps the two biggest uh, trends within the sector. More specifically, there is a huge discourse on the benefits and ecological risks of various stocking forms, not only because they might harm biodiversity through hybridization, through the introduction of non-native genotypes, but also because it costs money. And if it is not successful, then obviously the angling club, we have private fishing rights in Germany. So angler communities, 10,000 of those actually do the stocking. They are self-organized in doing the practice and they are very critical what they do with their budget. And there's a lot of conservation, but also fisheries debate around the stocking aspect currently. Secondly, the BOF hypothesis, the big old fat fecund female idea, meaning that these larger fish have a higher value for recruitment than previously believed, is another big trend in Germany. Most fisheries here are managed based on a minimum length limit. That means because we want um, subsistence to dominate and fishing is done for food, this means that there's very high exploitation rates on those larger fish. 
and particularly the more specialized anglers actually want to catch these larger fish and therefore are a big fan of the so-called harvest slot idea to maintain these larger fish in stocks. We have ongoing research in this area, but it's also very intensively discussed within the angler communities. It's a major topic that, uh, that is actually coming up and several angling clubs are now implementing the harvest slots because they want to conserve those big fish. But automatically you end in a catch and release debate because it fosters the release rates of these larger fish. And so you have the debate of trophy catch and whether that's ethically permissible and so on, tied into the management question whether harvest slots are a good idea from a biological reason. So given all that, um, I want to conclude by actually giving you a few steps for policy reform that might work in our environment, but perhaps also offer some uh, impetus for other environments. So this is from a paper we did with a bunch of colleagues last year in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. And we actually say there are five big steps that anybody can consider when developing recreational fisheries more sustainably. And the first one, clearly from an angler or fisheries perspective, is to always consider and express goals and objectives for recreational fisheries. This might seem trivial as a statement to you guys, but let's say a water manager or conservation manager will not necessarily have those goals when they make decisions about local situations. And in general, even if you compete between commercial and recreational objectives, adding the recreational fishing objective usually means that the goal shifts from a fishing mortality that maximizes maximum sustainable yield to one that actually maintains high catch rates and larger fish in the stocks. And that's usually one that is much lower than the MSY reference points. So I would argue that the MSY reference points have no big role in most recreational fisheries and they are better off by managing at lower fishing mortality rates than those that maximize MSY. A second um, big policy reform need that is actually already implemented to a great degree in Germany is to build, involve and strengthen angler organizations and to co-produce knowledge to make partnerships between science and the practical world. And we have the private fishing rights system already. I'm not saying it's better than the open access system. That's not what I'm saying. It's just how it is. And therefore you have organizations, most anglers are organized, and that's very good to filter, to talk, to network, to produce networks of interactions between science, policymakers, and the angler communities. If they are not organized, it's almost impossible to get a common voice, to reach people effectively, and to represent interests. So that's something that we think works very well. And we are seeing a big rise also in transdisciplinary projects where managers in angling clubs and scientists do experiments together on stocking, on habitat enhancement, and other things to learn together rather than the scientists just producing knowledge and then trying to communicate it. And there are many projects nowadays, some of which we are leading to actually involve people from the start and co-produce knowledge about how stocking works, how harvest slots works, and so on. The third policy reform need is to consider diversity in the broadest sense of the word, meaning, for example, the aspirations of different angler types, as shown here on the figure on the left, where the diamonds show the optimal regulations for different angler types, and you can see how strongly those input and output regulations vary by angler types, so it matters who you are managing for. And, but this diversity also means moving away from a single fishery perspective to a landscape perspective, where you actually strategically vary regulations and actions in space and let the angler self-sort, rather than trying to meet all anglers' aspirations in one system, which is practically impossible. Diversity management also transcends to the critical slow variables, those that are actually fundamental for system uh, functioning such as maintaining genes, genetic diversity, habitat diversity, and also knowledge diversity. And obviously there's a need for diverse management approaches. So moving away from a focus on size limits, perhaps with a back limit, and stocking to you know, have a diversity of these things and increasingly also in, uh, engage in habitat enhancement because this often is the more sustainable approach to increase the self replenishment capability of most stocks. And angling clubs in our environment are increasingly using those techniques, and that's probably a very good uh, development. The, first, the fourth level is providing the right incentives, because that's what's driving individual behavior. 
And the more harmful an individual's behavior is, the more costly it should be. And so anything that is rare, rare and more desired should be a very costly thing to acquire. For example, if you have very large fish and you want to take them, um, perhaps it might be useful to introduce harvest tax or other aspects of um, making those uh, making those um, highly desired but also rare goods more expensive. So there's an incentive to actually maintain them in the ecosystem. So for example, harvest tax is one idea, but costly could also mean costly access, for example, by not building every road to the lakes or minimizing, for example, the number of licenses that you have. And of course, that's socially reprehensible in some cases, but often needed to maintain the fisheries. Finally, the fifth level of policy reform is to improve monitoring, which is very hard in the hundreds or thousands of different lakes. It's, it's very hard to do. Modern technology can offer better ways, for example, for, for catch assessment. Um, but I think despite the need to improve in monitoring, that's a very strong thing we need in Germany because these angling clubs are often, the data that they collect are often not harmonized. They are not in databases. They're really bad understanding about the status of many fisheries. And despite, if we would in, do better, it will always remain data poor. So there is also a need to build on these techniques and use data poor techniques, maybe multiple ones, to actually inform adaptive management in order to remove the ad hoc, um, unplanned and you know, unstructured way of doing management to something that is more structured and learns by doing from past experiments. Um, so that's very, very important to work on in, 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 in achieving sustainable recreational fisheries. So to sum this up, at least for the environment, I oversee very much in Central Europe and specifically for Germany, I can say that recreational fishing has been losing support in society. Perhaps COVID is a turning point we have to see. There are increasing conservation and moral concerns and quite significant moves to constrain or even ban recreational fishing for conservation reasons in many areas. There are long-term increasing pervasive environmental impacts such as those of climate change and continued other pressures that strongly affect the functioning particularly of our rivers in hydropower that reduce the resiliency and recreational fishing has to basically work within those bigger constraints that they can really not tackle as a group. So that's something that clearly shows the interconnectedness between different social ecological systems and um, recreational fishing or more generally freshwater systems are often at the receiving end of those pressures. And finally, there's a move towards more science-based fisheries management, even in under, under our private uh, fishing rights regimes, where co-production of knowledge is seen as something very good, and there's considerations of alternatives to stocking, such as habitat enhancement becoming more prominent in these angling clubs. So with that, I wanna thank the team behind all of this, I'm, I'm, I'm communicating here what many people in my lab, but also collaborators in, uh, in the US, Canada, and other countries um, have been um, finding out together with me. So I want to thank them and the sponsors of our research. And um, the promotion at the end, who is interested in maybe helping us study these Central European recreation fisheries, we are currently offering two postdocs slash perhaps also PhD level positions, depends on the candidate, to work on Baltic Sea Pike around the island of Rügen. Uh, the first project is on the spatial ecology using telemetry techniques um, and the meta population ecology. And the second is more modeling, fisheries assessment and modeling projects. So if you're interested, uh, please reach out to me and I'm happy to talk about these positions. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a wonderful. Um, for the conference, I'm looking forward to the discussion.